very much. Thank you for the introduction. Thanks to you for waking up and showing up. And thanks to people watching in the stream room as well. Indeed, my name is Mikko. And yes, I've been working in this space for quite a while. Many of you might know that I always carry this with me to remind myself of where I'm coming from. It's an actual infected floppy from 1991. This one is infected with a worm called Form.a, which I analyzed back then in 1991, 32 years ago. And today, well, of course, for the younger members in the audience who are not aware of what this is, this is what USB thumb drives used to look like. <laughs> this is uh, single-sided, single-density, so 360 kilos of data on this floppy. And it's a good example on how the world changed. How the world changed because of the biggest technological revolution we've seen so far, which we now call the Internet. When I was analyzing this virus in 1991, I had no email. Our company had no website. Internet as a technology, TCP, IP, the protocol existed, but it wasn't in common use at the time. Mainly universities and research units had it, maybe some military installations. Companies were offline. In fact, our company didn't even have a local area network at the time. So you had PCs and Macs sitting on desks, but they were not connected to each other. They weren't connected to the outside world. If you had to move a file from one computer to another, you carried it physically, which means Worms and viruses, malware of the time, required humans to travel and take these with ourselves as we went from one company to another, one city to another, one country to another. Which means malware back then was spreading really slowly, as slowly as human viruses, like the flu or like COVID. But as we know from these human viruses, eventually the viruses go worldwide and they will hit every town in the world, which is quite crazy. But as we saw, that's what happened with, uh, with uh, COVID-19. Now, that blink was from my workstation, so let me just go to plain mode so we're not going to get any notifications. So. Fast forward 32 years to where we are today. Today, all the problems we see are online problems. The revolution changed the world and took all computers on the planet online. Right now, we are in the middle of the second wave of the Internet revolution, because the first wave took all computers online. You won't find a computer anymore which wouldn't be connected to the Internet. Or if you do find a computer which is not connected to the Internet, there's a reason why it's not connected to the Internet. Almost all computers are online. And the second wave of this revolution is happening right now. It's connecting everything else to the Internet. First wave, already behind us, which took computers online. Second wave underway, connecting everything else online. Eventually, everything we plug into the electricity grid, we will be plugging in to the online grid as well. This revolution is underway. So far, we've seen, you know, smart devices. Eventually, everything, if it uses power, will be online. And with that, we are creating a new world where societies are dependent on connectivity. 150 years ago, electricity revolution started in all cities in Europe. In my hometown of Helsinki, Finland, we got our first electricity grid in the year 1871. So pretty much exactly 150 years ago. That's when we started replacing the gas lights around our streets with electric lights. 150 years, well, it's a pretty long time, but actually not that long of a time for a such a massive revolution. During that time, every society worldwide has become completely dependent on electricity and the electric grid. If the power goes down and stays down, nothing works. We can't do anything. 
we can't communicate, we, our commerce halts, we can't move around. Your electric car, you won't be able to charge it, you won't be able to fill the gas tank of your gas car, because gas stations don't work without electricity. If power stays down extended periods of time, imagine a solar storm which would cut down electricity on the planet for a couple of years, we wouldn't be able to sustain our societies. People would start dying. And that's exactly what we are doing with connectivity now. During the last 150 years, our societies have become completely reliant on electricity. We are now building a future where we are exactly as dependent on connectivity as we are dependent on electricity. Is this a bad idea? No. It's a good idea. If you look back, look at the decisions made by our great-grandfathers and great-grandmothers who decided to embrace electricity, they made the right choice. We've gotten so much benefits and upsides from the electric revolution that the downside, the fact that now we are very reliant on that infrastructure, pales in comparison. And exactly the same thing applies to connectivity as well. But every technological breakthrough brings us benefits and it brings us downsides. It's a trade-off. Internet brought us so much new business, so many new forms of entertainment, so many different ways of connectivity that the downsides pale in comparison. But the downsides are very real. The fact that crime changed from a local problem to a global problem. The most likely crime you personally will be hit by, or your organization or company gets hit by, isn't a local crime anymore. Sure, someone might steal your bike or break into your house, but it's actually more likely that someone steals your account or password or scams you online. And that criminal isn't local. It's not from your city, unlike the thief that steals your bike. And this changes our lives more than the lives of most people on the planet. Because we, you and me, we are living in safe societies. Societies where crime rates are low, risks are low, corruption is low. Like Western large cities. We used to be fairly safe because we used to live in the real world. Now we live 50% of our time somewhere else than in the real world. And there we are as close to criminals as any other potential victim anywhere in the world. So for people who were living in, I don't know, South America or somewhere in Central Africa where crime rates are quite different from where we are living, their life didn't change as much because of the internet. For us, the change is much bigger. And this is easy to say, but it's kind of hard to really understand and digest how much it changed our world. And to illustrate that, let me play you a trailer for a movie. It's never been done before. What's the target? When was the last time? Can we turn it up? Just want to knock over a casino. Three casinos? Vegas. Vegas. Fantastic. The heist is impossible. Which movie? Who are the actors? George Clooney, yes. Brad Pitt, Matt Damon, and some others. So, a group of, if you will, gentlemen hackers execute a brilliant heist in which they break into the vault of some of the largest casinos in the world. Which casinos? Anybody remember? Bellagio. MGM Grand and Bellagio. Here's the website of MGM Grand from last week. <laughs> Here's the website of Bellagio from last week. They're now up and running. MGM Grand still has issues. But they were down for 11 days or so. They were down pretty bad. People couldn't check into their rooms. People couldn't play the slots or blackjack or roulette 
Restaurants were down. Restaurants were down because they actually couldn't get groceries in because their computers were down. Check-in didn't work. Check-out didn't work. Locking systems were down. Elevators were down. George Clooney, Brad Pitt, and Matt Damon were showcasing the good old times, to a world where physical attackers physically came in and stole cash. These attackers were nowhere near. They weren't in Las Vegas. And they weren't stealing cash. They were asking for a ransom in Bitcoin. Completely geography-free crime. This is what internet does. It deletes geography. And the victims are companies like these. I spent the last night in Novotel Mechelen, right next door. I checked how many rooms they have. They have 122 rooms. MGM Grand has 6,850 rooms. It's the third largest hotel in the world. Venetian in Vegas is bigger, and then there's a hotel in uh, uh, somewhere in Asia which has more rooms than that. But these are massively large targets for online criminals. Let me play you another trailer. Well, actually, before we, I play you another trailer, we'll just like, take a look at who was behind this, like who did the attack. Well, Alpha did. That's the website for Alpha, the ransomware gang. Alpha, one of the so-called Big Five. The Big Five of ransomware gangs, or Big Five of, of online crime gangs. I would count into the Big Five Alpha, Lockbit, Quantum, RansomX, and Blackpasta. It keeps fluctuating a little bit, but when, when you scroll down the Tor sites for these largest ransomware gangs, you very quickly realize how many victims they collect. They have new victims coming in every day. Huge companies, operations, well, like MGM Resorts. And the amount of money they make with these attacks is significant. And about money, now I'll play you the second trailer. And this is Vegas. Two a night, we'll never forget. Which movie? Which hotel are they staying in? Caesar's Palace. How many of you were in DEF CON this year? Which was in Caesar's um, what's it, what, do they, Caesar's, uh, what do they call it? Caesar's Forum. Caesar's Forum. Thank you. Right next door to Caesar's Palace. Caesar's was hit roughly 10 days after DEF CON. Roughly four weeks before MGM was hit. They were not down. No one even noticed that they were hit with ransomware. There were, was no disruption that was reported anywhere. If there was disruption, there probably was a brief disruption. It was so brief that uh, it didn't hit the news. Casinos continued operating. People were checking in and out. The restaurants were open. Why? Because they paid the ransom. The group that hit Caesars, which wasn't Alpha, asked them $30 million. They haggled the price down to $15 million and paid it off in Bitcoin and continued operations. Is there a lesson here? There probably is, and it's probably the wrong lesson. But this is an example on why companies pay. Clearly, Caesars fared here better than MGM. But clearly, this is also the wrong choice, because the more successful these ransomware gangs are, these big five groups are, the more attacks we will see, the more powerful they will become. The more money they have, the better attacks they will execute. Companies almost never fold or go bankrupt regardless of how badly they were hit. MGM, which is a publicly traded company, is not going to fold because of this. Caesars, definitely not. Their stock valuation took a little hit when 
this incident hit the news four weeks later. But uh, nevertheless, they'll be fine. I've actually been keeping track of companies that I know which have folded or gone bankrupt because they got hacked. And that list is surprisingly short. It has roughly 45 companies from all over the world for the last 25 years. Companies survive big hacks. Surprisingly well, actually. Even the biggest hacks you can remember, like I know, Sony Pictures. Sony survived fine. Actually, they were hacked again. They'll, they'll be fine. Better safe than Sony. <laughs> or, I don't know, Global Payments, one of the biggest credit card uh, leaks in history. Global Payments is a company which the only thing they do is handle credit card data. And they were hit and they lost tens of millions of credit card numbers. You would think that would be pretty lethal for a company which is specializing in that. It wasn't. They're fine. Maybe the, the, the best example, Ashley Madison. Remember Ashley Madison? A website that you can use to cheat on your spouse. Like you'll find a, 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 a nice lady or a nice man that you can cheat your spouse with. They were hacked and someone leaked the database of people who were cheating their spouses. You would think that that company would die because of that. They didn't. They're fine. Whenever I speak with companies, when I do briefings to leadership teams and boards, this is what I always tell them, that even if you get hacked real, real bad, you know, even if something disastrous happens, it's highly likely that your company will survive. Your company will be fine. Eventually, it will be fine. Your stock might take a beating. It's going to cost you a lot of money, but you'll survive. The company will be fine, but you won't. Because what happens in these cases is that the CISO gets fired, the CIO gets fired, the CTO gets fired, the CFO gets fired, even the CEO gets fired. This is how I motivate these leadership teams to listen to me. <laughs> that you know what? Your company will be fine, but you won't. Your company will survive, but you won't. In that sense, it was actually really refreshing, again, in, in DEF CON, uh, six weeks ago, there, well, in Caesar's forum, to listen to the CISO of Viasat. There's two different companies called Viasat. I'm speaking about the publicly traded US company which builds satellite connections for critical infrastructure. The company which was hacked by GRU, the Russian military intelligence, in February last year. They lost 42,000 satellite modems, which firmware was overwritten so that they couldn't recover the devices and they had to replace them. This happened in the beginning of the invasion. And this talk, which was really open, they, they were really great about how, how they told the world exactly what the Russians did. This talk was given by the CISO of Viasat, and he was the CISO when it happened, and he was still the CISO today. And I think that's good. It depends on, of course, like the exact circumstances, but if you have a leader who is able to recover and lead the company out of the crisis, clearly he's building experience that you'd rather have in the company. Now, of course, there are exceptions. If, if the CISO clearly is responsible for the, the, the shortcomings in security, maybe he should be let go. But I think it's actually much better to have people with real hands-on experience than people who don't. And about these leak sites and the big five, this is another thing I always recommend to people I speak with who are wondering about their exposure to attacks or about their uh, threat model. They know about ransomware, of course. They know about denial of service attacks. They know about business email compromise and all that. And they're wondering how likely it is that someone is going to hit them. Because most companies aren't very visible. Most companies aren't in the news or in the headlines. They're not very sexy. They're, you know, a, a company running a, a network of plumbers in the country. It could be a pretty big business, but it's not very visible. Why would anyone attack them? And what I always tell them is to take their Tor browser and go to one of these sites. And just you know, scroll around, look at the victims, and they'll see that, okay, two million 
150,000 to 300,000 ransom companies from Peru, Austria, Canada, United States, Denmark, United Kingdom. Companies of all sizes, companies in all business areas, companies from all countries. Why? Because most of these groups, groups like Lockbit, they don't look for a specific victim. Let's go and hack that company. No, they have a vulnerability. Or typically, their initial access brokers have an exploit against the vulnerability. Then they scan the whole internet. They scan 42 billion IP addresses, IPv4 address space, and they land up, end up with a list of vulnerable systems. And then they look at it. Okay, which one of these belong to companies we could probably ask some money from? And they end up with a random list of companies. Companies of all sizes from all different parts of the world. And this opens up people's eyes that, okay, if, if those companies were hit, there's nothing that would really protect my company either. This could happen to us. And it's also interesting to see how the big five brand themselves. That's branding. That's a logo. That's a name. They have a website. Same thing with Alpha or RansomX or Quantum or Black Pasta. They do branding because they need brand recognition. They need a scary brand. You can sort of imagine yourself going to the office Monday morning to realize that, oh my God, we've been hit by ransomware. And then, oh my God, it's Lockbit. Oh my God, it's Klopp. Oh my God, it's Alpha. Those of us who work in the space know that this is serious shit. These guys know what they're doing. They have used time to do lateral movement. They've most likely deleted our backups far away in the past. They've most likely found all of our data centers. The encryption they've used is strong, and we won't be able to find the keys. This is serious. They've done this multiple times before. They will execute exactly what they threat to execute. They will leak our files. They have stolen our emails. They have our documents. And they will put them available for download on their site if we don't pay. But they also have a reputation that if you pay, then they won't. Then they won't leak your files. They won't attack you again. They promise and they keep their promise. And they will give you tools to recover the encrypted systems. They will even work with you. They will work with your technical team. They have a tech support team which will assist you if there's problems. They will assist their clients, the ones who pay the ransom. Why? Because they need a reputation that it works. They want new victims to be able to go to old victims and ask, hey, how did it go? You paid the ransom. Did you get your files back? Well, yes, we did. We had some corrupted servers, but the Lockbit tech support team worked with our guys now we recovered everything. Five out of five would recommend. <laughs> so they need a reputation that they are criminals, but they're honest criminals. They need a scary brand, not entirely unlike the brand of real world organized crime gangs. So imagine, look, think about motorcycle gangs, like Hells Angels or Bandidos. That's a brand, they have logos, it's a scary brand. That's what they're aiming for. They want to be groups that you don't want to cross. So let me play you another video. Greetings, everyone. My name is Mikko, and I hunt hackers. Thank you all for joining our conference today. It's great to see you all. Greetings, everyone. My name is Mikko and I hunt hackers. Thank you all for joining our conference today. It's great to see you all. That's Laura Kankala, the threat in the lead for F-Secure. And that's a deep fake of me. Now, we've all seen deep fakes. There's nothing new here. But this is the level of homemade deep fakes today. This was done by a friend of mine, Atmaka, on his home computer with one NVIDIA GPU. And the end result is so good that I can't tell that it's not Mikko. And I am Mikko. 
So this is how good they are becoming. It's not real time yet. It actually took him two days to render it. So it's, it's not, with a home system, you, it's, it's a bit hard still to do a real time, like a fake Teams call. But clearly, if you have the equipment, you could do it already today. Anybody can do it in a year or two. Laura is from F-Secure. I'm from WitSecure. For those of you who uh, are, might remember that I used to work for a company called F-Secure, we split the company a little over a year ago. Old F-Secure renamed itself to WitSecure, and then we s s uh, created a completely new company in a spin-off, and that new company is named F-Secure. F-Secure does consumer security for home users. WitSecure does corporate security for companies and enterprises. I actually work on both sides. I'm an advisor for F-Secure, but I uh, get my paycheck from, from WitSecure. Clearly, 2023 has been the hottest year in artificial intelligence in history. And it's quite remarkable. Because we've been waiting for this revolution forever. And I do mean forever. The first time I read about artificial intelligence was when I read this magazine. This is Technic and Mile ma magazine, a Finnish popular science mag, from April 1983. This 1983 magazine has an eight-page special on artificial intelligence, explaining a future in which we will eventually have large machine learning frameworks using things like neural networks, which will become as smart as humans. This is 40 years ago. For 40 years, we've been waiting for this revolution to happen. And now, suddenly, it seems that things are happening every week. We are seeing large language models. We're seeing image generators, sound generators, deep fakes. And there's new stuff happening all the time. It's quite insane. So why now? Why after 40 years? Why now? Because three different technological revolutions happened roughly at the same time. The first revolution we already spoke about, the Internet revolution. And the importance of that revolution for this purpose is the fact that it turned everything into data. In 1983, you could only read this newspaper, or sorry, magazine, from paper. This wasn't available as data. Today, of course, you can go and buy a magazine from a store, but it, it will also be available online. All data we generate today, whether it's books or newspapers or magazines, is also digitized. In fact, we've gone back and digitized all the old content as well. You can actually read this online from a PDF today if you want, which means we've turned all of our knowledge into data, which can then be used for machine learning. That's revolution number one. Revolution number two, how the hell do you store all that data so you can use it for machine learning frameworks? And the answer for that is the cloud. It's, of course, a related revolution, but the fact that we have these massively large storage systems enables us to store enough data to build these hugely powerful machine learning systems. And then the last revolution. That's human hair, right here. The width of single hair is 100,000 nanometers. When you take a close-up look of, with the microscope of the chipset that you're carrying in your pocket, I'm assuming some of you have iPhone 15s in your pockets. iPhone 15 is using three nanometer technology. What does it mean? It means that the, it means that the lines between, uh, or the, the distance between the electric lines on top of the silicon dyes in your chipset is three nanometers. This was 100,000 nanometers. That's three nanometers. This is microscopically small technology. How do you build this? Well, there's no way to build this. It's impossible to make this. This is the hardest thing to do in the world. It's so hard, almost no one can do it. It's easier to put a man on the moon than to build one of these. 
One challenge we face when building modern chipsets is that three nanometer space between these lines is so small that light doesn't go through. If you take an original drawing of the chipset diagram, the one that you're actually burning on silicon dye to create a chipset, and you shine light through it, it doesn't go through. And that's a problem because that's how we do this. We actually burn them with light, with, with, with lasers onto these silicon dyes. So the way it actually is being done in factories such as TSMC in Taiwan using technology built by ASML is that you take a tiny droplet of tin, you suspend it in mid-air, then you shoot that droplet with lasers, turning it into plasma for a fraction of a second, and you use that tiny plasma bees which existed for a fraction of a second as a lens, and then you shoot lasers through that lens which will then condense the laser beams to be small enough to fit through these three nanometer drawings. Normal wavelength of laser is 400 nanometers. With this technology, it goes down to three, and it fits through the openings. This is insane. This is magic. And to make it even more crazy, this droplet plasma magic trick, for this to work, they do it 50,000 times a second. What? And we all carry these magic pieces in our pockets. And the most powerful of these pieces end up to these. That's NVIDIA H100. This is the thing that runs the frontier AI models. This is how OpenAI or Cohere or Anthropic or Google or Meta has run their machine learning frameworks and created these generative AI models. Maybe even a better example of this revolution is the fact that the mobile phones you have in your pockets right now, just 20 years ago, that computer which you have in your pocket would have been on the top 500 list. Top 500 is the list of the fastest supercomputers on the planet. Right now, the fastest supercomputer in the world is in the USA, number two in Japan. Number three is actually in Finland. It's a joint EU project. I've, I've seen the machine. It's called Lumi. It's the size of a two large trucks. It has its own power generator. 20 years ago, this would have been on that list. And this fits in your pocket. And it doesn't need a power generator. It runs on a goddamn battery. And it costs 200 euros. This is an insane revolution which has happened. The computing power that we've been able to create is the third revolution and the most important part of the revolution that created what's happening right now. Of course, we also made breakthroughs in how we do training for neural networks and how we build machine learning systems. Most importantly, the Google Research seminal legendary white paper from 2017, which is now known as the Transformers paper. And of course, by the way, all the images I have in the presentation are done with uh, stable diffusion or with mid-journey because it's much cheaper and easier to get images from there than buying them from stock photo systems or having a photographer create them for you. The trick that was um, uncovered in this legendary paper was the, basically shortening the attention span of machine learning systems from having really short attention span to having really long attention span. And this turned out to be hugely important. So for example, uh, in GPT, the T stands for a transformer. So what does the generative part mean, the G in GPT? Well, it means to generate in the sense that if you take a neural network and you show it enough content, then it can produce similar content. Large language models have seen a lot of text. Now they can generate text. Claude from Anthropic and GPT from OpenAI speak better Finnish than I do. And I am Finnish. No one ever taught them to speak Finnish. 
They were simply given every book ever released in Finnish. Then every newspaper ever released in Finnish. Then all content on Wikipedia in Finnish language. Then everything on Twitter and Reddit in Finnish language. And it read it all. And it picked up the language. And now it's a native. This is insane. It's surprising how well it works. I'm not going to do a hands up, but I assume most of you have read the legendary four-part trilogy, Hitchhiker's Guide to Galaxy by Douglas Adams. And those of you who haven't read it, what's wrong with you? <laughs> but in the book, the great late Douglas Adams describes a guide, a small handheld guide which has all the knowledge in the world. Everybody has this guide and you can just ask it anything and it answers. If Douglas Adams would be alive, he would be saying that, okay, now we have it. If you have a smartphone with internet connectivity and with a large language model, that's pretty much it, isn't it? Everybody has a copy of the guide which knows everything. And yes, of course, we, we all know this. If you use a large language model as a search engine, which is the wrong way to use it, sometimes it gets things wrong. It will lie to you. And by the way, you can actually make, for example, GPT work much better for you simply by adding into your prompt that, okay, tell me this and this and this. And if you don't know, tell me. And then it won't hallucinate on you. Then if it doesn't know, it doesn't come up with stuff. Then it tells you that I, I actually don't know that. It's much, much better. You will get much better results simply by saying to the engine that, you know, don't come up with hallucinations. If you don't know the stuff, tell me that you don't know the stuff. And this is brand new technology. Like, I started using GPT when it was a GPT-2. It wasn't available as a chat system at the time. It was just a language generator. You would start a phrase and click a button and it would continue the phrase for you. That's how GPT worked three years ago or two and a half years ago. Imagine how good these language models will be in five years, 10 years, 15 years. They won't hallucinate anymore. And we will end up with these narrow uh, large language models. For example, teaching models. Imagine a 12-year-old who's trying to learn something in math equipped with a narrow language model which isn't trying to know everything, just to know everything about that particular course in math. A perfect teacher will teach the child over and over again. Never gets mad, never gets angry, never gets tired endless patient and knows everything about the topic and never makes mistakes. This is a very powerful idea and it's at our grasp already today. And it doesn't have to be a child, it can be you. And it's not just text, as you know. I was blown away because I just simply tried this prompt with Midjourney 5.1. Give me an image of Batman in Helsinki with some snow. First attempt, no modifications. This. I mean, just, just look at it. Just look at it. That's a really good image. Yes, it is Batman. Yes, there's Helsinki in the background. There's snow on his shoulders. This is remarkable. It's seen enough images of Helsinki and enough images of Batman and snow. Um, I actually did. This is not the first try, because then I read it, the image, and added the prompt uh, uh, switch AR169 to change the aspect ratio so I could put it on my slide. But seriously, I've done no modifications, no photoshopping, no nothing. This technology is already highly useful. Like I said, I'm no longer buying images from stock photo libraries. And this gets us to the next question. These are real photos of me. Clearly, you can feed these into an image learning algorithm, and it can generate images of me. Easy. Many of us have done that. But then you can do things like, okay, that's images of Mikko, and here's images of Ken and Bobby. Mix these. And here you go, Mikko Ken. <laughs> 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 
And you can do this with any type of medium. Let me play you a, a, a clip from a YouTube channel called There I Ruined It. Yes. <laughs> I'm a Barbie girl in a Barbie world. Life in plastic, it's fantastic. You can brush my hair, undress me everywhere. Oh, come on, Barbie, let's go party. Cause I'm in a Barbie world. And the question is. Is this okay? I've now a couple of times submitted a photo of myself to an event like Brucon. Like organizers, thank you very much, have asked me, okay, can you, Mikko, can you send your bio and your image? A couple of times I've sent an image which I created myself with, typically with Midjourney. I take 20 or 30 images taken by a real professional photographer. And I create a new photo, which is its not a filter. It's not of the existing photos. It's a completely new photo. It's me in a different pose, looking at the camera in a different way, but it's based on the work done by real humans. And since I have, I, I pay for my journey, 10, 10 euros a month, the images I generate, I own the files, and the files are licensed under Creative Commons 4.0. They're free, which means you could take that image and print it on a t-shirt and sell the t-shirt. Is that okay? The photographers who took the work, who did the work, who took the photos, they, I mean, I couldn't do this without them, but they get nothing out of this. Am I breaking the law? Is this unethical? Is it unethical that Johnny Carson sings Barbie Girl? Johnny's dead, he's not complaining anymore, but what about the copyrights and trademarks? Is it okay that OpenAI Codex, which we mostly know as GitHub Copilot by now, writes code which is based on tons and tons of work done by real humans? I don't know. These are great questions. The solution cannot be that we cannot do this. We cannot train large language models or generative AI systems with content. Clearly, the benefits are huge. Mankind would suffer if you wouldn't be able to build these new systems. But clearly, the solution can't be that these frontier AI models just take all the existing knowledge for free and rehash it. There will be regulation in the space. We don't really know how it works out. But what we do know is that this technology and these systems will be misused, and they already are. Here's a uh, post from X, where Elon Musk has something to say. Hi. My friend got an idea of cryptocurrency exchange, and now he's product entering the world market on June 7th. He offers the best conditions on the market and an opportunity to get some crypto for free. It's your chance. Go to bitrelex.com and get your bonus. Do not go to bitrelex.com to get your bonus. It's a scam site, but it does sound like Elon Musk. It does look like Elon Musk. And this is uh, it's actually a fairly rare example of a real deepfake really being used in a crime. I mean, we all know that technology exists. There's a lot of you know, anecdotes and research and, and even articles about how this is happening left and right and deepfakes are everywhere and scammers are making millions. Uh, I don't think we're there yet. I mean. Te technology exists. You can do this. There are real examples. This is a very real example of that happening. But it's actually surprisingly hard to find these examples. Even harder to find examples of CEO scams or BEC scams being created with uh, deepfakes. Again, there's plenty of articles. Scammers are using deepfakes to call the financial department with a fake voice of the CEO. These articles are easy to find. Evidence of that happening for real is much, much harder to find. And some of those cases probably were not deepfakes. It was just someone who sounded a bit like the CEO or didn't even sound like the CEO at all, but the victim is convincing himself or herself that, you know, it must have been a deepfake. Because I'm not stupid. I wouldn't, wouldn't fall for a stupid CEO scam. It must have been something new which would have fooled everyone. It was certainly a deepfake. So I'm not saying that 
the technology is impossible. It's not. I'm saying that it, this isn't a commonplace problem yet, but it will be. Another problem, which will be a big problem, will be full automation of malware campaigns. Inside WidSecure or FSecure before it, we started building automation frameworks to automate our research work in 2005. That's when we started building machine learning systems into our endpoint security products. 2005, that's 18 years ago. All that time we've been waiting for our enemy to make similar moves. We've seen some moves this year. For example, in April we found this. LL Morpher, written by SPTH. This is a Python worm which carries an API key for OpenAI's API, and every time it replicates to a new Python file, it doesn't copy its own functions. It sends a description of that function to GPT and asks GPT to write the code in Python, and that's the code it <coughs> copies to the host files, which means it's different every time. This isn't spreading in the wild. It's on GitHub. You could download it today, but it's, it's not a real-world problem as far as we've seen. But it's a great example on the things that could happen. And I'm even more worried about full automation of not just a single piece of malware, but the campaigns themselves. You see, over these 18 years, we've built automation where our systems are very fast in finding new attacks. Automation is constantly running a network of honeypots and honey nets. It finds something suspicious, or our agents are sitting in customer networks looking for anomalies, and we see an anomaly, we collect a sample, then our automation figures out if the sample is good or bad. We, if it's a executable, we run it in different virtual machines with different settings and uh, different uh, uh, versions of the software, and we reboot it and try different dates and all that. And then, based on the outcome, what, what changed in the host system, the automation will make a call. This is good, or this is bad. If it's bad, all right, we want to stop it. We will automatically analyze it. We will create detection for it. We will test the detection. Then we will deploy the, the detection back to production. And all this happens in minutes. Same thing with malicious emails, malicious websites, potential exploits. It's all automated. And the enemy is still working at human speed. These ransomware gangs or phishing artists or what have you, they are writing their stuff manually. They create a new copy of ransomware, they buy access from an initial access broker, they scan networks, or maybe they are sending out emails with malicious links which go to websites which have exploits. And then when they see that, hey, our domain is blocked, hmm. we have to go and register a new one. Oh, our emails are categorized as phishing emails. Let me rewrite the email. Or our binary is blocked by endpoint protection. Let me recompile it, change the code. It's, it's humans doing this, which is slow. We know it's humans, simply by looking how long it takes for them to react. They start sending out an, out an attack. Our automation picks it up and blocks it, and then they'll react five hours later, or maybe the next morning. So clearly it's humans. If it would be automation in their end, they would react in minutes as well, just like we do. This hasn't happened yet, but it's not very hard to do. It's going to happen. The barriers for entry have totally come down, especially over the last, last year. And then when it happens, and we will see when it happens, because then they'll, they'll be as fast as we are, then we will see which one will win good AI or bad AI. I hope, I wish, I believe we will win. But that's all it is, a hope, a wish, a dream. We will see it for real very soon because this could happen today. It's going to happen in the upcoming months. And then we'll see for real. So yes, all this is very exciting and scary. AI 
can find zero days. It's pretty obvious. Maybe not today, maybe even today, but of course in the near future it will be able to find vulnerabilities. Now that's really good, that's excellent, and it's really awful. It's great when you're trying to find vulnerabilities in your own code so you can fix them. It's really bad when someone else is trying to find vulnerabilities in your code so they could exploit them. This is the trade-off we get. And it's the same thing, the same kind of trade-off we have in the longer term. Whenever we get into discussion about powerful AI models, then there's the discussion of the more distant future. Like what's going to happen in, in the future when these things will become so intelligent we should call them to be generally intelligent, as smart as we are in everything. Right now, computers are much smarter than us in specific things. Calculation, playing chess, searching the internet. When they are as good or better than humans in everything. Riding the bicycle, uh, teaching children, writing poetry. Then things will change. And some people will claim that it's the end of humanity. Machines will kill us all. Some people will, will claim it's utopia. Superhuman intelligence will solve all of our problems. Stop climate change, stop poverty, stop hunger, make us interplanetary. Nobody has to work anymore. Which one will it be? Well, we won't know. We don't know and we won't know. This is the equivalent of... Uh, Having a man or a woman, the average IQ in this room is 100. That's how IQ is defined. It's the average IQ for people. So it is as if a man with 100 IQ confidently declares what is going to happen in 20 years when we have 1 billion IQ AI. Of course we won't know. There's no way for us to know. It's as hopeless as it is, would be for ants to try to guess what we humans would be doing tomorrow. They won't have the capability to even guess. Will this really happen? Will we see superhuman intelligence on this planet? I believe so. When? Well, what I've said is that I think it's going to happen during my lifetime. I'm 54. I think I'll see it. I hope I'll see it. And all of these things happening around us right now are indeed very exciting, but also a little bit scary. Thank you very much. So we have some time for... Here we go. We have some time for questions, but before we go into questions, I want to mention that there's going to be a book signing later today. This is my latest book. It's called If It's Smart, It's Vulnerable. It speaks about many of the topics I, I spoke to you today. There's 50 copies of the book to be given out to you for free. And the signing is happening at 1 o'clock during the lunch break in the reception area. So first come, first serve. So I'll, I'll see you there. But now we go for questions. And we'll take questions both in this room but also from the streaming room. There's another mic over there as well. We'll start from this room. Do we have any questions? Do you speak English? <laughs> good, good. It would have been such a waste of an hour if nobody would have spoken the language. Thank you very much for taking the first question. Thank you very much. I found it uh, very inspiring. And uh, you discussed um, it is really exciting, all the latest trends and technologies. Also a bit scary. And there's like a fight between good and bad. What kind of advice would you give to our yeah, the younger people, the younger generation, in order to win the battle between yeah, the good and the, and the evil. Mm. AI safety and security researchers speak about alignment, aligning our interests with the interests of these AI systems, especially AGI or ASI, general intelligence or super intelligent systems. And that really is the key area here, because once we cross the line, 
once we become the second most intelligent being on the planet, we cannot go back and cross the line again. So we have to be goddamn sure whatever we are creating is aligned with our interests because we can't change it after that. Then we are the second most intelligent being on the planet and introducing a superior intelligence into your own biosphere sounds like a basic evolutionary mistake unless you're able to align the interests of the creation you are creating to be uh, aligned with your interests. So it would be, mean basic things like it would be set in stone with these superhuman intelligence that, you know, when you are completing your missions or tasks, it's more important that we're able to switch you off than it is for you to complete the task. Because completing the task might in include getting rid of humans if they would be in way of completing the task. So we would have to be able to stay in charge somehow. And that would mean creating rules, laws and regulations. We could already imagine things we should regulate today. Things like AI must never have right to privacy. AI systems mu must never have rights to incorporate and create companies. AIs must never be able to own anything. AIs must never have a bank account. And I know this sounds weird and like science fiction. What, what do you mean? But if something is scary, it's the idea of self-aware superhuman intelligence. But what's even more scarier is the idea of self-aware superhuman intelligence which has a billion euros in his bank account. That's scary. Because then all the rules are off. Because it's really easy for us to imagine that, you know, it's a program. Like, what, what could it do? Come on, it's running on a computer. We'll switch the computer off. Okay, now imagine a self-aware superhuman intelligence which creates a lot of wealth, and it could easily make a lot of money if it's superhuman intelligence. I'm just trade stocks or sell and buy Bitcoin with a clever algorithm and it has a billion. Now it has a billion. It can bribe anyone. Hey, could you uh, open that port for me? I'll pay you a million. No? Okay, I'll pay you 100 million. Um, someone would do that. Or it would just incorporate companies with all the money it has in 100 different countries and hire uh, other companies to start to build data centers for itself. And suddenly it's running its system in 100 different countries at the same time. Try turning it off now. So these are the kind of alignment issues we, we should be thinking about as we are on our way to this future where we are, number two. And the winner takes it all. The first frontier model which will go and cross the line will forever be the best. Because now once it's smart enough, the system will be able to improve itself and keep ahead of the competition. And this is also a little bit problematic if you think about geopolitics and game theory. I'm not a fan of Vladimir Putin. But in 2016, he said something that I actually agree with. Putin was giving a talk to university students in 2016, and someone from the audience asked him about AI. And Putin answered that AI is the future. Whoever controls artificial intelligence will control the world. So let's imagine a press release next month from, I don't know, Cohere, or uh, Inflection, or Anthropic, or OpenAI, or Meta, or uh, Alphabet, announcing that we've made it. We're hitting AGI, and right after that, ASI. We're going to announce it next week. How would the dictators of the world react? They would immediately calculate one and one together, which is that those guys are about to have it. If they get to superhuman intelligence, that company, that country, that society will win everything. From now on, they will win everything. They will always win. We will always lose. They will be superior in everything. They will have 
the best products, the best economy. They will innovate better than anyone else. They will win every fight. They will win every war. We must, at any cost, steal that technology. And if we can't steal that technology, then we must, at any cost, destroy that technology. That's what game theory, basic game theory, would or might tell to us. So these new developments might actually create geopolitical instability simply because they are so powerful technologies. We'll take a question from the other room through the microphone in the streaming room. Are there any questions here? Yes. One question. Uh, really inspiring talk, uh, but uh, basically now AI uh, is based on the existing knowledge. Uh, uh, how do you estimate uh, when in, in, in the future or in the timeline uh, AI could be able to do its own research and to generate like new fundamental knowledge. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. great question. Now, any timelines I might mention are probably wrong. It's, it's, <laughs> these are very hard things to, to... It's almost the same as people ask you, when will we see the first real quantum computer? It's always a couple of years in the future. That's what AI used to be like, but now suddenly things are happening for real. Maybe quantum will happen for real soon as well. Maybe AI research or AI models will actually figure out the rest of the problems we are facing with quantum, which might be an example of the kind of research you're referring to. One thing which is going to happen is that part of these source material which are being used for machine learning systems will be created by the machines themselves. In fact, this is happening already. There's more and more content on the internet, which is created by large language models. And then we scrape the internet for content and feed it to new large language models. Is this a problem? Maybe, but maybe not. It really does depend on how the system is able to handle and understand the information. The most practical thing I do with large language models myself today is speed up my digestion of information. Now, most of you probably have pasted information to ChatGPT. Sure, you can do that. But with Claude from Anthropic, you can actually upload PDFs. That's what I do with white papers. I, I read through a lot of research through a lot of white papers. If I don't have time to read them through, I'll just take the PDF, upload it to Claude, and ask Claude to give me a summary. I might ask Claude to give me a summary in Finnish. It doesn't matter. It's the same summary, and the language is perfect. It's my, my native language, so I typically ask it for Finnish. And it gives me you know, a screen full of summary of a 40-page white paper. It reads through the white paper in a second, and it understands it completely. How can I say that? Because I've tested this with dozens of my own papers, of my own research, and it always gets all the things right. It's, it hasn't failed me yet. I trust it. So these systems are able to digest the source material and, and find the key parts about there. So I think we will see these system fairly, systems fairly soon to be able to do new research, which is crazy, which is exciting and a little bit scary. A question from this room. We'll take in the far back. Yes. We'll, after this, we'll take one more question from the other room and then the final question from this room. Yeah, hi, I was just wondering, you said you uh, trust the actual model, like to summary, like summarize the uh, PDF that you sent through it. But I was wondering, uh, have you already seen like actual supply chain attacks on these models, like in the wild, mm -hmm. by utilizing, for example, homograph attacks, or um, by uh, trying to bypass explainable, uh, like explainable AI systems, like mm -hmm. Shop and Lime, uh, like to obfuscate such attacks, by any chance? Yeah. 
Yep, there's tons of things that um, can be used to attack these systems. In fact, we've seen first uh, attacks against our machine learning automation years ago. Uh, we started seeing attacks where someone was uploading samples to our sample analysis systems in huge quantities, trying to teach our systems wrong, trying to make them, like uploading malicious files which they were labeling as clean files, for example, pretty basic attack, but we saw actually much more advanced versions of those attacks as well. So yes, you can use, you can use jailbreaks to escape these models, you can obfuscate the content you send, you can make them learn wrong, so there's plenty of attacks. What is quite interesting, I'll actually have an example of what they're doing in some of these frontier companies like Anthropic and, uh, and OpenAI. If you go and look at the OpenAI white papers or for example GPT system card, which is a really remarkable document, I recommend reading it through, you'll see that the amount of red teamers OpenAI actually has to look at these models is significant. Like the, these companies are taking this problem, this particular problem, very seriously. They, they try to break them on their own over and over again. Maybe the most, most famous example of this is, is uh, actually know the researcher who, who was part of um, the red teaming test when they took GPT-4 before it was released, gave it money and gave it access to the internet and then they gave it tasks. And during those tests, um, for example, GPT-4 on its own went and bought some hosting services and booted up some virtual machines to run some code, which is nuts. But it's also a great example of the challenges these, the, the red teamers face because when it was registering accounts to, to spin up virtual machines, GPT-4 ran into this. And it couldn't figure it out. I mean... And these engines are becoming really good in figuring out captures, but it couldn't figure this out. But it still had to complete the task. So what did it do? It went to a freelancer website and hired a human. <laughs> Even better, the human that the robot hired to break the captures challenged the robot, saying that, hey, why do you need me to break these? Like, are you a robot? And then GPT answered the human by lying and saying that, no, no, of course not. I'm visually impaired. I can't see this. Could you please help me? And then human cracked the captures for the robots. I mean, these are the kinds of tests they do to figure out, they go, I mean, obviously, we don't want this. And they, 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 they try to find these before they release their models. We'll take a question from the other room and then the last question from here. Test. Is there anyone with a question from the streaming room? No. Okay. I think uh, we're done here. Thank you. you. Is there anyone in the streaming room? Yeah. <laughs> There's one guy in the streaming room. Okay, last question from here and then we go for a break. Yeah, so you say that uh, the people who believe uh, that AI will bring us a better future, believe that it will solve the, the great problems that we have, like climate change mm -hmm. and uh, poverty. Um, we tend to see those things as technical problems, but they're actually largely ethical problems. So how do you see uh, the ethical part within AI, the, not the ethical part that is using materials that are uh, copyrighted or something like that, but AI being ethical itself? Right at how that relates to humans responding to that. Right. Will it have morals? Will it have ethics? And if it does, will those be aligned to ours? Or even things, things like, will, will these superhuman future technologies, will, will they believe in something? Will, will they be religious, for example, which is a really weird idea. It really depends on how we will build them. Um, the technologies we have today, these generative AI, neural network ideas, they might eventually grow powerfully, powerful enough to cross the line, but it might be something completely different. Um, there's interesting research being done in a couple of different universities, for example, on brain simulators, which would simply build intelligence by simulating a human brain. This research is still far from finished. We don't fully understand how human brain works, and even if we would, we don't have Power, powerful enough computers to simulate every neuron and every synapse, but computers are getting more powerful, our knowledge is improving, maybe one day it's possible. I, I think it is possible eventually 
to simulate a human brain. And if we succeed in that, um, then it's going to be a brain. It's going to be a human without a body, just like us. Will have exactly the same morals and ethics as we do. Would like to live their lives like we do. Would like to work and have hobbies and romantic interests. It would dream. It really depends on how we will be building these systems. But clearly, we are intent on building systems which are smarter than we are. And there is no law which says that intelligence and creativity or morals and ethics has to come from meat. Like we are made of meat. Humans and animals, and of course humans are animals, are made of meat. So far we've only seen creativity and intelligence from things made out of meat. But there's no law which says that that's the way it has to be. We can create creativity and intelligence from things which are not organic. And if we want to take it to a more, uh, I don't know, metaphysical level, I do believe that when last human dies out, there will still be intelligent beings on this planet. Maybe that's the legacy we leave behind. Thank you very much.